Okay, um, good morning. It's time for for the lecture, so please uh, turn off the computer screens and let's get started. So we have our second exam on Wednesday this week. So today is from today. We're going to have our second exam. The material that is going to be included in that exam is the material we cover until last Wednesday. Okay, so today's material is not going to be part of the of the exam. Um, we have a review today. Um, I'm going to complete the lecture, and then we're going to have a couple of slides discussing uh, topics on on the exam, and also the homework that you have to do for today. You're going to keep that homework. You're going to discuss that homework. And then you're going to submit the homework on Wednesday. So the homework is going to be used for, as part of the review for today. Um, and one more thing I have. No. Oh, I should have your homework, homework 5 graded, like this afternoon. So if you want to pick up your homework later this afternoon during my office hours, you can do that. Or if you want to stop by tomorrow to collect that homework so you have it to study for the exam, you can also do that tomorrow. So um, you're going to have your, your homework number four if you, you already have that one. Homework five is going to be available today. And then homework six, you're going to keep, you're going to discuss that one today. And you're going to submit that one on Wednesday. Okay, any questions? Okay, so one more time, the exam is on Wednesday, and the material we're covering today is not part of the of the exam. So on on Monday, well, Wednesday, last Wednesday, uh, we started discussing some of the material handling devices that you can use in in, in industry. And we talk about some of them, um, like the industrial trucks. But today we're going to continue on that line, and we're going to talk about a different type of material handling equipment. Uh, this one is called positioning equipment. And this one is used to handle material at a single location. So that the material is in the correct position for subsequent handling, machining, transport, or storage. Uh, unlike the transportation equipment, positioning equipment is usually used for handling at a single workstation. The material can also be positioned manually. Using no equipment. So again, having no equipment is also an option, but you know that you're gonna have to be careful in terms of the results that they can have for your employees, in terms of injuries and so on. So as compared to the manual, to manual handling, the use of positional equipment can provide the following benefits. Uh, raise the productivity of each worker when the frequency of handling is high, improve the product quality, and limit damage to materials and equipment, and reduce fatigue and injuries when the environment is um, inaccessible or hazardous. And this is coming from research performed by the Mother Material Handling Society. 
and this kind of makes sense, right? Because you are trying to provide a better environment for your employees. Um, you will try to, by including this equipment, um, improve these three areas. So as we did for the other two, here's a list of the different type of equipment that is available. So starting with no equipment, then we have dot lever, ball transfer cable, rotary index cable, parts feeder, air film, device, voice balancer, manipulator, and in, an industrial robot. For that last one, we have one here in this, one of the labs in this area of this uh, floor. Uh, one of our manufacturing uh, engineering faculty have one of those robots here in, in his lab. So if you're interested in seeing one of them, you can talk to, um, to Dr. Chen. So um, positioning equipment, here are some examples. Uh, the lift turntable is right here. This can lift and also, as the name says, you can turn this table. Um, this is rotary index table. So again, you're going to be moving parts around, and there will be processes happening to that particular product. And this one is more for uh, warehousing. So you're going to be providing this type of lever for those uh, forklift. Um, this one is kind of similar to the robot. Um, there's a part feeder, so this is going to be rotating according to the needs. Um, this one looks like a forklift, but use a different type of, of strategy. Or um, so this one works with, with air. Um, some cranes, uh, vacuum manipulator. I have not seen this one, but. Um, Imagine that you're going to be having some backing here to move those uh, parts that are heavy. Um, An industrial robot, this is the one that we have here in the, in the lab. Another type of material handling equipment is called the unit low formation equipment. And this one is used to restrict materials so that they maintain the integrity when handled at single load during transport and for storage. Some of the advantages of this one is that more items can be handled At the same time, and enables <coughs> the use of standardized material handling equipment. Some of the disadvantages, um, time spent, forming, and breaking down, the unit load. The second one is cost of containers. So you will put these units together somehow. Um, most of the time you have some uh, type of plastic cover so that will put all these things together in, in, on top of a pallet which allow you to move them together from one location to another. But this also in, includes the cost of containers
or palette and other load restraining materials used in the unit load and finally those containers or pallets or anything else that you're using to carry all these units together so these empty containers pallets may need to be returned to their point of origin. You might need to return them back so that you can reuse them for uh, the next batch. So on the next slide, we also have some examples or the list of material handling equipment of unit low formation equipment. So pallet kits, sheets, uh, pallet boxes, cartons, bags, crates, intermodal containers, uh, palletizers, and we're going to show some of them with some pictures now. So I'm pretty sure some of you are familiar with this one, or most of you. Uh, you can see these anywhere. Um, slip sheets, kind of the same idea with the different uh, material. Uh, most of them, most of the pallets are done and you see wood. Um, this one is also very common. This allows you to put stuff on top of the other allocate those boxes. Um, unit low formation equipment is pallet boxes. So instead of having just the product on top of the pallet, you also have some type of con container, wood container. Um, intermodal containers, pretty sure you have seen those before. Um, those are the ones that are carried by trucks. Um, some magnetic type of robots that will allow you to accommodate those products inside of a pallet or box. This one, I've seen this ones in the airports. So this is basically a wrap that they put around the products once the pallets are completed. Same idea when you have to transport your luggage and you want to cover it with some type of plastic, have the same type of machine. And you also have the manual palletizing. Okay, so um, another type of material handling equipment is called the storage equipment. And some of the potential reasons for storage includes um, time, friction, allows the product to be available when it's needed. Um, processing uh, for shown products like the wine, <clears throat> storage can be considered a processing operation because the product undergoes a required change during the, the storage. <clears throat> and finally, securing So, for example, if you have very toxic waste, you don't want that to reach um, people that are not authorized. So, nuclear waste storage might be one of the examples. 
some of the examples uh, for storage equipment. We have multiple here, uh, selective pallet rack, drive-through rack, driving rack, uh, pushback rack, sliding rack, shelf, storage carousel, automatic storage retrieval systems, or ASRS, split case order picking system, and a mezzanine. And again, here's some pictures of some of them. So most of this equipment is going to be found in warehouses. Um, and that provides you some, some ways to storage more items. Um, Multi-level type of storage, like these two. Um, flow through rack, uh, driving rack, these are for trucks. Uh, pushback rack, so this provides some type of uh, mobility for those items. Same thing here, the sliding racks. You, see, you can see that forklift moving on those aisles. Um, shelves, bins, drawers, uh, storage carousel. This is the, kind of the the system that you'll see in a laundry facility, in which you can storage and then move, uh, depending on the position that you want to put the item. Um, these are more uh, automatic type of uh, storage equipment, in which you're going to place something in this area, and you're going to have some type of elevator putting the, the items in the right place. Uh, same thing here. Um, split case order picking system. These are more manual type of storage equipment. Um, here you have another type, which is an elevator. So you have the person doing the manual picking and storage moving throughout the, the aisle or the elevator. Then finally, we have identification and control equipment. Um, yeah, some of you might be familiar with the uh, RFID type of identification and control system. So these products will have some type of code, barcode on it, which will allow you with sensors to track the, the location of those items and where they need to go. Um, so that's the, the idea. So this is used to collect and communicate the information that is used to coordinate the flow of materials within a facility and between facilities and its suppliers and customers. Some examples, barcodes, radio frequency, RF tag, magnetic stripe, machine vision, portable data terminal, and electronic data interchange uh, internet. Um, so, when this is done manually, the identification of materials and associated communication can be performed manually with no specialized equipment. Although it is sometimes possible to manually coordinate the operation of material handling systems, it becomes more difficult. to do as the speed, size, and complexity of the system increases. So there will be a point in which you will not be able to do this manually. So it will require some type of uh, assistance from equipment. So barcodes uh, are unique. Barcodes pattern represent various alphanumeric characters. Um, so for this type of system, you will require a label, a scanner, 
and a barcode printer. And eventually, you're going to have some sensors reading these barcodes and telling you where the, the item is and where the <coughs> item should go. Um, low contract barcode scanners include uh, fixed beam, moving beam, and omnidirectional. And 1D or one dimensional codes are most uh, common. 2D codes enable most greater data storage capability. Um, RF tags or radio frequency tags. Here the data is encoded on chip. In case in a tag. So here there's no contact. This can be read when the tag is within 30 feet of an antenna. And these are the tags that you will see on your cars when you go through these uh, hallways. So they can read that um, chip with the information. Um, tags can either be attached to a container or permanently or temporarily to a an item. And these tags have greater data storage capability. than the barcodes. Then we have the magnetic stripe. These are the ones you see in your credit cards. Uh, data encoded on a magnetic stripe. that is readable in almost any environment. This requires a contact with the reader and greater storage capability and more expensive than barcodes. Um, machine vision does not require explicit encoding of data. Since objects can be identified by their physical appearance, no contact but typically requires structure lightning. And this is more flexible than other identification equipment, but it's less uh, robust. <clears throat> a portable data terminal. This can be a handheld. are mounted or vehicle mounted data storage and communication device uh, communicates with a host computer via a radio frequency or infrared link and a variety of input devices available, such as keyboard, barcode, scanners, voice headset, and so on. So this is like having a small computer with you. <clears throat> um, electronic data interchange provides standards for inter-corporate transfer of purchase orders, invoices, ship shipping notices and other frequently used business documents. Um, this was prior to the internet. Uh, EDI require expensive dedicated value added networks. Um, this is critical for implementing just-in-time 
manufacturing. So remember our discussion for just in time, you're going to be pulling from some areas according to your need. So if you go empty for one of the areas, you might need to send an order to a supplier that was performed uh, using or is performed using this type of um, uh, device. So on the next, how we have deciding on picking medium in picking operations. Um, as part of warehousing operations, and uh, specifically in picking operations, identification of the parts and their locations can have an impact on the picking speed. Uh, so for example, if you are working in Amazon and you have an order coming from a customer and that our order have multiple items, then you need a person or a robot that goes and grab all the items to put together that order. So that's what we are trying to explain here. Um, so the following are the most commonly used mechanisms for communicating picks to order pickers. Uh, label picking. Pick to light. Radio frequency barcode picking and voice picking. Um, equipment selection criteria, um, you have to look at the material characteristics. Um, here we have different categories and measures. So um, this should allow you to decide which one will work better for you. Uh, physical state, depending on the type of item that you need to carry, the size, the weight, shape, the condition in terms of if it is hot, cold, wet and the safety risk and risk of damage. So here are some examples of the measures that you can consider for each one of those categories. And I like this type of uh, graphs. This allows you to decide depending on the quantity of the material moved and the move distance, what type of equipment you should use for um, handling your your items. So if it is high in high quantity of material and the move distance is short, then you should use a conveyor. Um, the other side, if you have low quantity of materials and a short distance, you can use manual handling or hand -work. Um, in terms of the flow rate, here are some of the methods that you can use. So if you have quantity low, distance short, um, manual hand truck, which is what we just discussed, and high short, conveyor, or vehicle train. In terms of the layout type, uh, we discussed the different type of layout at the beginning of the of the course. Um, so you should use a fixed position type of layout if you have large product size, low production rate, and the typical material handling equipment, trains, or industrial parts. Um, if you have a layout type of process, <clears throat> then you have variation in product in processing, low and medium production rate. You can use hand truck or three GDs. If you have a product layout type, uh, limited product variety but high production rate, for those type of layouts, you should use conveyors 
for product flow trucks to be deliver components uh, to stations. So this slide basically ties up the the relation with material handling equipment and uh, the layout. <coughs> sorry, of the facility. <clears throat> and we also need to talk a little bit about safety and ergonomics. So as we discussed in most of the <clears throat> equipment types, there's always an option to do the task <coughs> manually, but there will be a risk involved for your employees. So that's why this uh, came into place. So safety and ergonomics. Uh, scientific research shows that increasing injuries at certain levels of exposure to heavy, frequent, and upward lifting, and this makes sense, right? Um, if you have an employee doing this type of task for a long period of time, you should expect to have some type of injury or, um, or that will have an effect on the employee. So job design is very important in creating safe and healthy work environment and the selection of proper material handling devices can help with reducing some of the material handling, handling related injuries. <clears throat> so, as an engineer, and a factory engineer, or industrial engineer, working not only for uh, facilities planning, but in general, you have to take care of your employees you have to pay attention to uh, these areas. So heavy lifting, frequent, uh, frequent lifting, and hard lifting. <clears throat> so there's some, again, these are um, topics that are discussed in more detail in a course called Methods of Engineering. But here are some of the ideas. Uh, there's some uh, requirements that are dictated by the government that you need to satisfy. Um, <clears throat> so here's some of them. Um, so depending on the weight of the object, you will have some type of um, reaching capability, lifting capability, um, and that will depend also on the individual. So this gives you some guidelines for that. And the principles for reducing heavy lifting, first of all, you can reduce the weight by maybe decreasing the number of units that you have in one pallet or in one of the boxes that the employee needs to carry. Uh, so reducing the weight, increase uh, the weight. Um, That should be there. Uh, sorry about that. Use uh, mechanical assistance, slide instead of lift, and use multiple people to carry the same item, so team lifting. <coughs> um, principles for reducing frequent lifting, use mechanical um, assistance, avoid unnecessary lifting, and use mobile storage. Another um, principles for reducing upward lifting, remove obstacles, slide closer, reduce uh, the shelf depth, reduce the package size, and use mechanical assistance and team lifting. And in terms of bending, um, we can use also mechanical assistance. <clears throat> you can add handles. Arrange the storage, and finally avoid unnecessary 
uplifting. <clears throat> so the same idea, this is kind of logical, <clears throat> uh, but again, it's very important. Reducing the number of injuries is also a way to reduce the cost in your factory or in your facility. Um, so that's always, uh, in addition to use, um, take care of your employees, you're also saving some money to your company. Um, for in terms of principle for reducing outward lifting when reaching above shoulders, again, same principles, arrange, storage, use mechanical assistance, or material handling equipment, use a rolling stair, or safety lab. Finally, principles for reducing artwork lifting when twisting. Use conveyors. Provide more space. And arrange storage. And then you can also rotate um, your employees. If you think that one of your employees spent too much time doing some lifting in lifting tasks, um, it's always good to have your employees trained for multiple tasks so they can rotate for your um, for different needs that you might have. <coughs> and the use of mechanical assistance. Okay, so in terms of safety and ergonomics, you should be familiar with OSHA, uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. If you are in charge of doing supervision of employees, most likely that's where you're going to start. As an engineer, you're going to be in charge of a particular area of your company, most likely a production line. So you're going to be in charge of supervising your employees, performing schedules, uh, and making sure that your production are satisfied, your requirements in terms of productions. Um, so this is very important. You need to make sure that your employees are working on, on a safe environment. And finally, uh, these are just pictures of some of the things that you might see that are not very safe. So uh, this one is you're having two workers to take that thing on a higher level. <clears throat> so finally, these are the agenda for this lecture. So we cover some of the material equipment, TV handling equipment that you'll find in the industry. And we also talk about how this relates to uh, facility planning and facilities design. Any questions? No questions? Okay, so again, half of this lecture is cover part of the material for your second exam. Um, half of the lecture is going to be part of the third exam. Um, and now we can transition to the second part, which is... <laughs> Until industrial trucks. That was slide 50. Any other questions? Fifty. Fifty, yes.
<clears throat> okay, so in terms of the review for the exam, you should expect the same format of the exam that you saw on our first exam. So we're going to have multiple choice, that was the first part, or true or false questions. Uh, most likely there are going to be 10 of those. And then the second part will be two to three topical problems, short answer, explanation, description or mathematical type of problems. These problems should be um, similar to the problems that we have seen in class during the lectures, during the homework, and the lab. Okay, so you need to make sure that you understand the problems that we cover in class, problems that were assigned for the homework, and the problems that we discuss on the labs that were performing class. Um, in terms of the topics, uh, we start with lecture five. We talk about supply chain management. This was more. Um, there was not a lot of math in this lecture, but more uh, an explanation of supply chain management and how that applies to facilities planning. So we discuss what is supply chain management, uh, a supply chain strategy framework, the components of supply chain management and the obstacles and common problems that you will find when you're uh, dealing with supply chain management. Then we transition to space requirements and layout. Uh, we talk about structural system performance, enclosure systems, atmospheric systems, electrical and lighting system, and live safety systems. So here's where we design um, for heating, cooling, uh, for your utility, and also the electrical uh, lighting requirements for your facility. So we covered those items in class. We performed um, some labs uh, related to those topics, and also we had some homework. Um, then lecture seven was some personal requirements. Um, the employee uh, description of what is important in terms of restroom design, uh, we also talk about how to design the parking lot for your facility, so that's also important. Um, office planning and uh, barrier-free compliance. Um, and then last week, we covered the schedule design, which uh, described why it's important to have a marketing information when you're designing for your production. Um, we talk about process requirements, how many machines do you need according to your requirements, and also the machine assignment problem. How the number of machines affects the idle time of your employee or your operator and the idle time of your machine. So remember for this one in particular, and then we're going to see that in one of the problems uh, of the homework. When you Let's say you have 2.5 <clears throat> as the number of machines that you can assign to your uh, operator. You can go to 3 or you can go to 2. The decision is going to be based on if you want to have your employee or the <coughs> operator idle or if you want to have some of the machines idle. Because if you go above, if you assign 3 machines to the operator, you know that the operator is going to be running, setting up the machines, and there will be a time in which he will not be able to get to the machine because he's too busy and he has more machines that it should be assigned to the operator. But if you go down to two, then you know that the operator is going to be idle because it's going to be waiting for the machine to be uh, done. Okay? So we discuss those details. And then finally, the material handling equipment. And that's what we uh, discuss in terms of some of the equipment that is important for you to know when designing and um, working in a facility. And how does that relate to facilities planning? So in terms of preparation for the exam, you need to study your lecture slides, labs, and homework. Remember to bring your calculator. I'm going to be providing the details, the tables, um, uh, formulas, or provided formulas. Um, so the only thing that you need to know is when and 
how to apply those. Okay, so make sure that you understand the tables, when to use the tables, um, and so on. Yes. Homework that we had last time was equivalent to or equivalent to? Like, could we like have taken off one? Yes, um, and we can revise that if you have your homework. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Any so those type of details in terms of the coefficients that you need to use, I will let you know. Those numbers you don't have to memorize, but you need to know it when to apply those uh, to your problem. And so the exam is closed book and notes. The only item you will be allowed to have in your desk is a calculator. And remember to clearly show your work formulas using your solution. This will allow me to uh, provide with partial credit. Now, any questions? So as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, I wanted to use the homework that was due today as part of the review. So we have two problems to sign. Here's the first one. Um, we have parts. Part X requires machine on a milling machine. So we're going to have two operators. Uh, two operations that need to be performed to this machine, A and B required. So that's what I'm showing here. You're going to have this type of layout, you can say, for the operations. And then we have, um, excuse me, we need to find the number of machines required to produce 3,000 parts per week. Um, so that's the requirement. And then we also have some information about the number of days per week and the number of hours per day that you're going to use for production. So I created this table just to list the information that we have, so 3,000 parts per week, number of days, number of hours, and number of minutes per hour because we have to do some um, unit transformation in order to get everything in the same units. We also have some information about the operation. So operation A, A has a standard time of 3 minutes, efficiency of 95%, and reliability of 95%, and a detect rate of 2%. And B, 5 minutes standard time, 95% efficiency, 90% efficiency of reliability, I'm sorry, and 5% defect rate. So we want to find the number of machines required to produce these 3,000 units. So, based on our discussion, we know that in order to find the number of machines, we need to uh, compute F for each one of the processes. So we're going to have an F for um, process A and F for process B. Um, but in order to find that Q, we need to find the input for each one of the operate, operations. So in order to find uh, the Q, B, we need to find the input that is required for B, and that's going to be determined by the defect rate. Okay? So we have Q, B equals 1 I, B, which is the output of B divided by 1 minus defect rate. That should be 3,758. And then for QA, we have the detect rates of process B and process A. The output is still 3,000. So for that one, this is the input, 3,222. So I would say that's the challenge. The challenging part of this type of problem is finding this. And this is something that you learn how to do already. Uh, so we are using that, um, and using this information then you can compute the number of machines. Um, but we also need to make sure that we are using the right unit for H. So we have five days a week, 18 hours, and we want that in, in minutes. So that will be 
400 minutes a week. So we have age Q, uh, we have the standard time, the efficiency, and the reliability. So now we can compute FA and FB. And that is the number that I have here. So FA is 1.98, FB 3.42. So when you uh, sum those two, this is 5.5 machine. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes. You need to produce 3,000, so that's your... QB is 3,000 over 1 over, over 1 minus DB, which is 1 minus 0 0.05. QB is going to be the input of... Yes, it's here. So this is the output that you have. You need to have at the at the end. Okay. Yes. Well, um, for this one in particular, since this is going to be allocated in terms of time. It's not necessarily a integer number in terms of the machines. Um, so this is basically you need five machines and half of the time of the other. That's a good question. Any other question? Yes. So this problem rounding up to the last half of the time. Yes, that that would be the same thing to do, rounding up to the next half. Okay because that will give you, okay, five machines and half of the time of another machine. Or if you go above 0.5, then you can say, okay, six machines. So machines A and B are all doing the same. Because like, the way I read it is like machine A does a set of operations so you need this amount to compute that. Um, so both of them are main machines. So yes, both, both of them are the same type of machines. So you can add them together. That's a very good question. Any any other question? Okay. So we have another problem, and for this one, so in case you haven't read the problem itself, here's the information. So you have semi-automatic mixers are used in paint plants. It takes six minutes for an operator to build the apathy pigments and paint base into a mixer. Uh, mixers run automatically and then uh, automatically dispense the paint into 50 gallon drums. Mixing and unloading take 10 minutes to complete. Um, mixers are cleaned automatically between batches. Take four minutes to clean each mixer. Um, between batches, an operator plays empty drums in the magazine to position them for filling and it requires six minutes to load the drums into the magazine. Uh, filled drums are transported automatically by a conveyor to a test area before uh, being stored. Mixers are located close enough for travel uh, between mixers to be visible. And what is the maximum number of mixers that can be assigned to an operator without creating idle time for the mixer? So again, the question is actually referring to avoiding idle time for for the machine. Okay, so that means that you can have some some idle time for the operator. That's more important. That it's more important to have the machines working than having them idle. So you will force to have enough operators to keep the machines running. 
Okay, so another thing that is important here is what are the the processes that are performed and as part of the machine process step. So we know that it takes 10 minutes to complete the mixing and unloading. So that's performed automatically. So that's part of the machine processing time. And also find those tasks that are happening concurrently or between batches because that's how we find these parameters. So A is the concurrent activity time. That includes loading, no loading the machine. Um, B is the independent of the, uh, operator activity time. So those are things that the operator will do um, separately. Um, we have the independent machine, machine activity time. And then N is the number, ideal number of identical machines to assign to an operator. So using those parameters, we can uh, find the number of machines. Okay, so <coughs> it's right. Here. So the these tasks, the operator log load picket, this is something that the operator does by itself. Okay, prepare those mixers to be put into the machine. So we can assign that as a concurrent activity. I'm sorry, as an independent activity of the operator. So that's B. Then we have the machine automatic cleaning that's happening between batches and also the operator load and empty drums is also happening between batches. So that's part of the uh, machine concurrent time. And then we also have the machine mixing and unloading, which is 30 minutes. Okay, so identifying those, I think, are the most challenging portion of this type of problem. Okay, so, yes, sir. That's a, that's a good question. And again, it's... This is something that is happening um, before you get into the production, right? Like, uh, you're setting up the things in order to put it into the machine. Yes, and, and the other thing that happened with this specific task, and I, I get what you're saying. I mean, you're putting the, the thing into the machine, and you're, you're getting that portion of the, and that performed by the operator. But that's not repeated anywhere else. But once you do that, see what I'm saying? Then the other tasks that are going to be happening during the operation are the loading and unloading of the drums and also the cleaning between batches. So you're saying if you're at the day, he doesn't have to go to the operator? Yes. So the operator itself is performing <coughs> these tasks of the, it's like setting up the machine. At the beginning, and then that's something that is not repeated any day, anywhere else during the process. How do you pull that information out of that? I mean, that's all we want. 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 The description that I'm providing here in terms of loading. Well, the the problem tells you the the things that are happening between batches. So every time you complete a batch, 
We can imagine an operator brings empty drums into the magazine, teaches them to get in, they require to take into those drums. And also, the mixers are clean every time the batch is complete. So those two things are the ones that are happening. Yeah, but what I'm trying to show you here, it's not that you solve the problem just by a recipe. I'm trying to see how can you see the difference between the two. Um, so maybe if we look at the expression itself, A plus B uh, and A plus T. So the expression at the top Yeah, that's what I want to say. This this description here, this was um, getting that uh, confusion. Um, but if you look at the the expression, you know, I promise you, if I put something like this in the exam, it's going to be more clear. It's not going to be as confusing as this one. Uh, yeah. Yes, but um, just one more thing here. This portion of the equation takes into account the machine time, like the time it takes to complete a whole process for the machine. So that would include the processing time or the machine activity time plus the extra things that are happening for the machine to run. So like the cleaning and the putting of these drums. So the machine can continue. This one right here takes into account the operator. So we have the machines, and we have the operators um, tasks. Um, but again, this right here, yes, it's, it's confusing. Um, so my explanation for this portion here is that this is happening at the beginning of the process. And it's not repeated. And he wants to do it not repeated anymore. And it's something that the operator is doing part of the of their independent work. Um, but yes, it involves the machine and the loading of the machine. Um, yes, so I guess we can, yeah, I, we can revise the answer. reason it again one more time is because this is happening just once, but again, it involves the loading of the machine, so I guess we can see it from both perspectives. Um, so in that case, um, A, and you all have the same proficient or same answer, we're taking that as part of the loading. So that would involve
the loading of, of the pigment. plus the loading of of the sum <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I think what, okay, so, this time I'm going to say, so you can need to take it flat down if you, but I don't know the one that is the process of operation, if you are the one that is the operator, that is the idea, okay? And he's going to be telling on the both of them. Okay, so that's a comparison in time. Oh. That would involve... So that would include... Um, the loading of the but the magnets is part of the so you cannot run the machine without loading those drums So that will be the time for loading the mixers and also the time for loading the drums. Then let's look at B. So B is the independent operator at the time. So we have walking, stacking, stacking, uh, and then we have loading and loading. So initially, I have that as. as the loading of the pigments, but now we are not uh, considering that as part of the independent time. So for that, we're going to have zero. <clears throat> and then we have T, which is the independent machine time, um, including the machining time of the, which is 30 minutes. and the automatic cleaning so 
when computing those, we can as the number of machines to assign to the operator. According to what is required in your, so this is saying what is the number of users that can be assigned to an operator without any other time So how would you answer that question? It is three. And why is that? Yes. If you have four assigned to the operator, that means that you will not have enough time. The operator will not have enough time to cover all of the mixers. Okay. So at some point, one of those mixers is going to be idle because you will not have the time to go and fix all the the mixers. Okay. So that's why you go down. That will also create a problem in terms of the idle time for your uh, operator because if you have less machines assigned to the operator, that means that at some point your operator is going to become idle. Okay, but here we are focusing on having our machine, our mixers, with one operator, so that we only assign three machines to the operator. Is that clear? Any questions? Yes, yes. You can. Uh, you're gonna submit that homework on Wednesday with your exam. Yes, sir. Yes, the solution manual is not always correct, and you shouldn't have access to the solution manual. Yes. I might have, as an instructor, I have an erased data. All books have errors, and I have that listed in my solution. Okay? So you can get in trouble by having the solution manual. Yes. Initially, I was having a B defined as that six minute period. But again, that's within the computing of the loading of the machine. So, in terms of specifying parameter B, I need to be clear in terms of okay, the operator is going to be moving from one place to the other, um, walking, stepping, those things that are not affecting the actual process.
Yes, so, so they tend to be the, like the form, or the formulas, you mean like the QA, QB, and or what, what formulas are you talking about? Yes. Um, because like in the past, like two homers, we had like a lot of like, details. Yes, so, so those are going to be provided. Okay. I'm going to provide you with these details. It's not a way that you can memorize all those. Okay, details, yeah. so just like you know how to use them. Yes. Right, Tables and formulas are going to be provided. Okay, in the homer we turn into one. What? The one yes. 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 So homer we turn you keep it, revise it, and then submit it on Okay? I was just trying to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this is specifically operating on there, so therefore they're showing the, the confirm. And then the look in the drum, so I, when I picture this, I mean, you have to kind of have a visual vision of what's happening. So it's making it make things, and then you have like a self uh, mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of drums. So, unloading the drums doesn't involve the mix. Well, it's automatic, like, I think that's, that's, then, that's also... I mean, maybe it's something on my part, uh, but it doesn't specifically stay in the thing that you mix it with, so therefore, I should know that it's operator only, therefore, I can't really identify it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but this, this is important. I mean, the, the way I see it, mm -hmm. I mean, is that once the batch is completed, you have to go. It's not like you can keep putting drums into the machine without when the machine is running. Like you're gonna have. But that's the sense that it was put into a magazine. You can magazine sometimes change that thing, like a magazine on the machine. Yeah. Magazine on the, you know, you can't resolve that. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's a misunderstanding of the statement from my part. Yeah. Well, I mean, going straight off the definition. Yeah. So I guess maybe confusion is here with the concurrent activity. That's just what's happening at the same time that the, the machine is running. So, so based on that, then these two are happening concurrently, or not? Just, just like the formula says that first is the volunteer, uh, the machine is the volunteer, and first is the volunteer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're both involved in making up the size together. It is when the machine is loaded, the machine is loaded, unloaded, which takes the first timeline of the process. Mm -hmm. so, Yeah, we're looking at a timeline, right? And you have a machine, and you have a person. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're both being involved in the same And then machine takes off, and they don't run the same. And then you go ahead and 
dump them to uh, do those things for the format, right? And during this time, you know, we got some vital time over here or whatever. Walk around, we got some stuff. And then he's going to move his, uh, he's loading the magazine. And he does four vital time. And then he has an existing pocket back over here. Now we have to sense everything and went down through current cycle, lost cycle, and then we start the thing over again. And we are uh, loading the key again. That's the way I see it. And that's what we're talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the six minutes, six minutes, and then he's running six, sorry, four, six, three, four, six, three, four, and therefore we maximize the machine operation. To see the process running in order to, yeah, yeah, because um, yeah, we are making assumptions, and depending on the assumptions, we can uh, solve the problem. So, A is the concurrent activity time which involves the loading and unloading of the machine. So that's why. So I have the both of the operations that are uh, involving the loading of the machine. No. No B. And then the processing time that includes the time for the machine plus the 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 cleaning. Yeah, and if yeah, I might not cons I, I might not have this in. Well, I would think about it, but I don't think I'm gonna put this in the ten because it's it's not clear. I for for most of you, so I might I would not put something like this in the ten. Yeah. I will yeah. I will send an email. Yeah. Yeah, and we can get back to this. I might I might come back to this after the exam bring some other examples, and then we can clarify any questions, and then go from there. Uh, tomorrow, send me an email, I can let you know. I would not have hours open, but if you if you send me an email, I can tell you what to stop by. I'll be there tomorrow, this afternoon. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I don't have the homework with me. This one's were submitted late, so that's why I have them. Um, but I will have them. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, but he has a valid excuse if you're trying to schedule an interview. Okay. 
No problem. Oh, Thank you. 